Zechariah chapter 6, we've been moving along in this study here, looking at these night visions. That's what we've been looking at. We come now to the last of these night visions. Number eight, it's been a long night for Zechariah. It's been a long night for him. In one single night, Zechariah has been receiving eight visions that have meant to bring encouragement to the people there in Jerusalem, meant to encourage them in their rebuilding of the temple and let them know that God's not abandoned them, God's not forsaken them, God is still with them and for them, and God is on the move. And these visions are meant to kind of lay that out for them here. This is what we are, are looking at here. And, and Zechariah, it's been a long night, he's even had to have an angel come in chapter 4 and, and wake him up, you know, and sort of get him alert. Zechariah, stop sleeping here, we've got more stuff to go through. And so it's been an interesting time for Zechariah. Maybe an interesting time for us as well, going through all these things. But we've seen that, that Jerusalem's been a bit of a mess. The temple has been destroyed, and, and the city is just kind of lying in ruins. And so this small contingency of people have returned from Babylon with this in, incredible task before them. It's been, it's been pretty, uh, you know, seeming like an insurmountable task before them here to, to accomplish all this. But God is coming to encourage them. Now, it's interesting because according to Zechariah 1, uh, verse 7, let's see here. Yeah, according to Zechariah 1, verse 7, we know just when Zechariah received these night visions. It was February 15th, 519 B.C. It tells us there in Zechariah 1, 7, on the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month Shabbat in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo, the prophet. So, there it was, right there for us, the second year of Darius, in the 24th day of the 11th month. So February 15th, 519 B.C. That means, guys, it was exactly 2,532 years to the day last night. How about that? Pretty cool, huh? I planned, I planned that. Three years ago when I said, I'm going to do Zechariah, I'm going to make sure that I'm on chapter 16, or chapter 6, right here on February 16th. This is wonderful, isn't it, how you do that? But it's the night where the Lord... Possibly is speaking in dreams and visions. Anybody have a dream or a vision last night? Seems like it's a popular night to have it. Anybody? I had, I had a dream that I was, I was with these NBA players. No lie. This is no kidding. I think it was like, I, I, seriously, no lie. Like LeBron James and there's somebody else. I can't remember who it was. But, and we're just kind of joking around having a good time. And, and I, I woke up just feeling like, Lord, you're not letting my dream of playing in the NBA die. This is awesome. I feel like there's something to this that I think really the Lord wants to. Anyway, so. Just keep in prayer about that. I think I, the dream is not dead, so still a chance. And that's really what, uh, what the Lord is doing here in Zechariah. He's letting them know, listen, guys, don't, you know, don't let these things die here because God is at work. God is moving, and he's revealing these things to Zechariah to communicate to the people there in Jerusalem in this task that they have before them. So as we cover the last of the visions, the eighth vision here in chapter six, let's first of all just review all those other visions that we've looked at and, and just kind of again review what they were significant of, what they symbolized, what they, what they meant. So first of all, in chapter one, verse seven to 17, there was the vision of the red horse rider among the myrtle trees. And Zechariah looks and he sees this, this red horse and a rider and he's standing among the myrtle trees. And it was it was revealing there in that passage we covered God's anger against the nations and, and there was blessing on restored Israel that was coming for them. The, the, the word went out that all the nations were at rest. All the nations were at ease. Everybody's just feeling comfortable like, ah, we're having our way. Everything's good. But God was on the move and, and he saw all these other, you know, kind of uh, riders and such. And it was God's ministering spirits, his angels that were moving out, going to and fro the earth. God was at work, moving about, you see accomplishing his plan then in the second vision the four horns and the four craftsmen Zechariah chapter 1 verse 18 to 21 and it symbolized God's judgment upon the nations that afflicted Israel so the four horns covered those four nations that have come and and brought affliction against against Israel and then how God was going to come and and quash, uh, squash and basically the four craftsmen doing that and then there was a man with a measuring line in Zechariah 2, and it showed God's future blessing on restored Israel as God came to, to measure out, you know, Jerusalem and, and take stock of what was going on because God was going to come and bring blessing. Then we saw in Zechariah 3 the present priesthood, which again showed Israel's future cleansing from sin and, and reinstatement as a priestly nation. 
There was Joshua, remember, standing in these filthy garments, and God uh, reclothed him, gave him new clothes, and, and uh, showed this removal of sin that was going to be coming, God cleansing them from sin. Zechariah 4, covered that just a few weeks ago, and that was the, the lampstand and the two olive trees beside it. And that was to show that Israel was to be God's light to the world, and they were to be empowered by the Spirit. Remember, the priests were there to fill the oil, keep the, the lampstands fresh with oil and keep them burning. But here, we saw that there between two olive trees that were being fed this oil permanently and, and continuously, that it wasn't a work of man, it was God. And oil was a symbol of the Holy Spirit. So God was saying that, that Zerubbabel, huh, you're trying to accomplish this work, don't worry about doing it in the flesh, you're, you're going to fail in that. It's going to be not by might or power, but by my spirit, says the Lord, Zechariah 4, 6. And so Zerubbabel would be supplied with power by the Holy Spirit to accomplish this difficult task that was before him in the rebuilding of the temple. And we saw last week the flying scroll, Zechariah 5, uh, verse 1 to 4. And that was the curse of God against individual Israelite sin showing here how they were guilty against the law of God as the scroll was opened up here. And two of, of God's commandments were laid out there and just kind of pinpointing how it was encompassing all the law and they were guilty before it. And a lot of you women were away at the women's retreat last Sunday. Uh, we did talk a bit about you guys because we covered a woman in the basket and uh, the Lord said the woman was wickedness. And so we, um, yeah. Prayed for you guys all at the ladies' retreat a lot. No, that's not the case. I heard you guys had a wonderful time at the ladies' retreat, and I don't mean to make light of that, but uh, I hope those three days were fruitful. Okay, all right. <laughs> Listen, I, I mean well by that. So, um, <laughs> the woman in the basket, yeah. And it was a measuring basket. And uh, we saw here how that was, again, the removal of national Israel's sin of rebellion against God and, and how that was being taken back to the land of Shinar, which was Babylon, and how Babylon all through uh, history has been this symbol of rebellion against God. We're going to touch on that a little bit again here today. So here now in chapter 6, as we finally get in the chapter here, we see now in this eighth and last vision, four chariots. It's going to speak of divine judgment on Gentile nation. So let's um, cover that here, chapter 6, and let's read through the first few verses here together, verse 1 to 3. Then I turned and raised my eyes and looked, and behold, four chariots were coming from between two mountains. And the mountains were mountains of bronze, with the first chariot were red horses, with the second chariot black horses, with the third chariot white horses, and with the fourth chariot dappled horses, strong steeds, it says. Now, this vision had some similarities to the first vision there in Zechariah 1. It's as though these, these two visions kind of form a bit of a bookends here for the, the set of visions that Zechariah is receiving. It kind of has a bookend effect here, enveloping the whole series of visions. Now in Zechariah 1, we saw these horses with their riders. And the horses also there in that chapter were made up of, of different colors. And they were there patrolling the earth viewing the various nations around Israel. But here in chapter 6, now we don't see any riders. We just see these horses pulling chariots. And again, they're horses of different colors. Dappled colors believed to be a spotted or, or grayish color. Most see it as a spotted kind of horse. But both terms, they've been used in, in various translations. Some will say grayish or spotted. Most will just say dappled horses. So word we don't use as much today. But Listen, we're going to get to the significance of these colors in a second, but let's look, first of all, at the setting here a bit more, because it says that these chariots were coming from between two mountains, okay? Coming from between two mountains. Some have viewed these mountains as simply being symbolic. Mountains spoke of, of strength, it spoke of a position of power. Of course, any city that was built upon a, a hill, a mountain, you know, was seen as a, a great defense and an impregnable kind of a force there. It was a distinct advantage in having high ground, of course. But others now, they've looked at these two mountains as being literal mountains, real mountains that were there in Zechariah's day. The original text in, in, in the Hebrew gives a, a definite article before it says, the two mountains. So it seems like it's speaking of two specific actual mountains. And many have believed these two mountains to be Mount Zion and Mount Moriah. 
all right, right there in Jerusalem. And between these two mountains is the, the Kidron Valley. It's a place and scene when the Lord Jesus comes again. We know, and we're going to see this in Zechariah as we move along uh, in a few weeks, but Jesus is going to come and set his foot down on the Mount of Olives, right? And it's going to be the scene here for the Lord's return. So many believe that these two chariots are coming from between these two mountains, and specifically speaking of Mount Zion and, and the Mount of Olives there. But notice here, it says that these two mountains were mountains of bronze at the end of verse 1. Mountains of bronze. Now, bronze was one of the principal metals for fashioning instruments of war and, and armor. But bronze throughout Scripture was also a symbol, uh, a picture of judgment, ultimately. The altar that was used for sacrifices in the tabernacle uh, and in the temple, that was made of wood, but it was covered in bronze. It was called the bronze or the brazen or brass altar, and it's where the sacrifices were laid upon, and they were burnt, and God's judgment there basically for sin was being poured out. So this, this brazen or bronze altar, again, a, a symbol of judgment. We saw also Moses had to make a serpent of bronze to put on a pole for people to be healed when they were struck with this, with this curse. And it says in Numbers 21.9, so Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And so it, it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. And Jesus is seen with feet of bronze depicting judgment in, in uh, his, his visitation with John in Revelation chapter 1, verse 15. It says, his feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. So not only has Jesus come and, and received judgment for our sin there on the cross, but he has come through that as one refined as in a fire and jesus is able to lead us through now as well he's able to lead us through now those fires because he's been refined he see that judgment for us so here he is with the feet of uh, uh like fine brass so the scene here of this eighth vision is certainly one of judgment that's what we're looking at here these chariots coming between two mountains of bronze it's a it's a picture of judgment that is coming and it brings us to an interesting correlation now with the color of these horses that we see here in Zechariah 6 and another passage of scripture Revelation chapter 6 also verse 1 to 8 and in that passage it reveals for us in Revelation 6 the four horsemen of the apocalypse each having similar colors in Zechariah's vision is that just coincidence I I would think not but look at here in Revelation 6 verse 2 it says that there's a white horse that emerges and spoke of power and victory. That particular horse in Revelation 6, it, it spoke ultimately of the Antichrist who is coming. All right? It says he's coming. There's a, there's a crown and, and, a, and a bow, and he's coming with this false peace in a sense. The Antichrist coming onto the scene at the beginning of the tribulation. All right? But what's going to follow here? Look at this. A red horse now in Revelation 6, verse 4. It spoke of war. All right, he's going to come bringing a false peace, but there's ultimately going to bring about a war as he's as he's bringing the nations together against God and against God's people, Israel. And then Revelation six five, a black horse spoke of famine. Oftentimes, after war, you're going to see a lot of of supplies and everything just be wiped out, and and famine is oftentimes a result of war. So it's following the wars, famine, and then in Revelation 6, 8, there's a pale horse, spoke of plagues, disease, and death. It could be that this dappled horse, this spotted horse in, in Zechariah 6 is speaking of these plagues that are going to come, this disease and death, ultimately. So we see a, a, a similarity, a correlation. Though there might be different meanings to what's happening in Revelation 6, we see certainly some similarities there between the horses and the colors of them. And it's all coming in Revelation 6 at the onset of the tribulation. And, and again, those horses, though there's one that, that's the Antichrist coming and all these other things, these are, are simply tools of God's overdue judgment that is being poured out on the earth. That's what the tribulation is, guys. All right? Now, thankfully, we as a church are going to be raptured up before the tribulation, before these things come to be. And God's going to pour his judgment upon a, a Christ-rejecting world. And these now, these horses, these four horses of the apocalypse are simply God's tools now to be executing his judgment upon a world that has rejected his son, Jesus. And so here in Zechariah, now he receives this vision of God's impending judgment that's going out into all the earth. So 
again, a lot of correlation there. But unlike the Revelation account, these horses now are pulling chariots, all right? Pulling chariots. Chariots were seen also as instruments of war. They were equivalent in our day to tanks. You know, when an army goes out and you see tanks going, it's like, man, all right, these guys mean business, right? And in this day, chariots really had that same kind of picture with it. There were some chariots that were, had two wheels, some had four wheels. Oftentimes, there was a, a three-man team in these chariots. One would be a driver. The other would be like the archer who's, you know, shooting. And then the other one there would be the defender. He'd have the shield and protecting the other members of the team. And so they'd be riding forth, going out into battle here. So the presence of chariots here suggests a battle. It's the Lord on the move, and he's coming to carry out his judgment into the world, all right? This is this eighth vision that Zechariah is receiving, this judgment of the Lord. And again, we see chariots throughout Scripture as being this, this action of the Lord coming now. Ze- Psalm 68, verse 17, the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of thousands. The Lord is among them as in Sinai in the holy place. And then in Isaiah 66, Verse 15, for behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. So we see throughout scripture these chariots being mentioned here. And again, it's it's God on the move here coming to to exact his his judgment. Now, as you read through these visions and, and maybe you're wondering if you're missing something, if you don't get the meaning of these, I read through Zechariah, every time we open this up, I'm reading through this, and I'm getting nothing, Brent. What is this all about? Don't feel bad, because you're not alone. Because here's Zechariah now. He's receiving these visions. He's seeing it all. He's just sitting there going, I can't make sense of this. What are you trying to say here, God? So Zechariah, what does he do? Look at what he says here. He's not making sense of it either. Verse 4. Then I answered and said to the angel who talked with me, What are these, my Lord? And the angel answered and said to me, These are four spirits of heaven who go out from their station before the Lord of all the earth, the one with the black horses is going to the north country. The white are going after them, and the dappled are going toward the south country. Then the strong steeds went out eager to go, that they might walk to and fro throughout the earth. And he said, go walk to and fro throughout the earth. So they walked to and fro throughout the earth. And he called to me and spoke to me, saying, see, those who go toward the north country have given rest to my spirit in the north country. So Zechariah is often having to, and, and he's got this angel, this interpreting angel that's with them in each of these visions. So Zechariah's not left alone. He's not having to wake up and go, man, I need to go consult somebody. I don't know what in the world I was just shown, you know. I mean, there's chariots and there's lampstands. There's all, what does this mean? He's got a, a ministering angel right there with him. He's got uh, an interpreting angel that's there explaining to him what these things mean, all right? Giving him help, giving us help. So the angel says to him here, Listen, these chariots, these are four spirits of heaven. So the angel is simply telling Zechariah, these chariots, they're horses, they're representing these spirits that are going out now to carry out the work of the Lord ultimately. And speaking of angels, we know as, as, as this angel says they're spirits, we know what Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14 says, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? So angels are seen as, as ministering spirits, all right? And so this angel now says to Zechariah, they're, they're four spirits of heaven. They've come from the throne of God, all right? They've come from the throne of God, and they're on the move now to go and carry out the Lord's work. They're, they're ministering spirits, as Hebrews 1 tells us. And they're on the move going in specific directions, this angel tells Zechariah. The black horses, it says, are going into the north country, and the white ones are going after them. And the north country is typically the route that the nations would, would take in coming in to invade Israel. In coming against Israel in invasion, they would come through the north route typically because there would be the, the large you know, Arabian desert to the east. You got the Mediterranean Sea to the west. So in this vision, we don't see anything mentioned about east and west because these were areas that typically people would not be traveling in. So when Babylon would come up against, um, against Israel, they would come up from the, the north, all right? So we see these two horses now and chariots going up into the north country, the route that a lot of times people would come. The dappled horses, they went to the south country, and that's probably in connection to Egypt, which was, again, a perennial enemy of Israel to the south. So they're going towards the south. But it was those who went to the north country that it tells us in verse, um, in verse 8 that they have given rest to my spirit in the north country. So there were two 
emissaries, two groups uh, of chariots and horses that went up to the north there, the black horses and the white horses. And it's significant here as they're going up to the north. Many believe that this is likely referring to the conquering of Babylon. Now again, Babylon was already conquered at this time by the Persians. The Medo-Persians came and conquered them in 539 BC. So it was already conquered, but again, there was this idea of Babylon that was continuing on in a sense. It, it perhaps has its complete fulfillment with the final judgment of Babylon that we read of in Revelation 18. Again, I mentioned we talked about that last week in the vision of the woman in the basket being taken to Shinar to, to Babylon. Because we saw how Babylon was not just a geographical place, but it was a system of false religion and of impure commercialism. It was used as an idiom to, to really show all that which opposes God. All right? Now, Babylon ultimately had its, its beginning, its root, with a man named Nimrod, who built his kingdom, the kingdom of Babel. And we all know about that in Genesis 10. And this was a counterfeit to the truth. And it, this counterfeit to the truth has woven its way all through history, right there from the beginning of Genesis with this man by the name of Nimrod. And it's woven its way all through history where there's been this strain of false religion and this I impure commercialism which has brought greed that's, that's, again, distracted people away from the Lord, you see. But it's going to have its end during the tribulation as the Lord pours out his judgment. Look at what Revelation chapter 14, uh, verse 6 to 8 says. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Notice that here there's, again, through the book of Revelation, we see oftentimes these angels that are going out, carrying out the Lord's work, just as Zechariah is seen with these four chariots, and the angel saying, these are spirits going out from the Lord, carrying out the Lord's work. So here in Revelation, we see oftentimes these angels carrying out God's work and even his judgment. And, and there in, in Revelation 14, verse 7, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So it's interesting, it says, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. It's repeated. Because again, there were, there were two Babylons that worked. There was religious Babylon, and there was commercial Babylon. That's at work. And Revelation 17 and Revelation 18 speaks about these two Babylons that are at work. That's this strain of opposition against God. And again, like I said last week, check out our website. If you want to hear more about that, turn, tune into our, our study through Revelation, chapter 17 and 18, to get a little bit more idea about this work of Babylon that's at work. Because here in Revelation, during the tribulation time, if Babylon had fallen in 539 BC, why are we hearing about it now in Revelation? Because it's continuing to work. It's that spirit of Babylon, this false religious system that opposes God, that the Antichrist is going to be head of in this false commercial system that, again, is going to have the Antichrist very active in. So, as we see in that passage in Revelation 14, it's these angels that are active in proclaiming the judgments of God and in carrying out his work. Now, back in Zechariah, these horses, it says these strong steeds went out eager to go. <clears throat> and they're taking delight in going as, as emissaries of the Lord. These angels are excited. They're, they're like, Lord, let us go. They're just like chomping at the bit here, all right? That's a good expression for these horses carrying these chariots. They're just chomping at the bit. They're just like, Lord, let us go. We want to get moving. We want to start carrying out your work and your will. We want to see all this opposition and the enemies of God squashed. We want to see this happen so that the kingdom of God may come. I mean, that's what these guys are, are looking forward to, what they're thinking about. And it's, it's being described as these strong steeds went out eager to go. And so they're roaming, it says, the earth, going to and fro, carrying out God's work and seeing his will be done. Now, again, in the book of Revelation... In chapter 7, we see this scene of, of angels at the four corners of the earth ready to enact God's judgment. Look at what Revelation 7, verse 1 and 3 says. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, 
having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, do not harm the earth, the sea or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. So God's judgment is, is being poured out and the angels are ready to, to see this happen. But they're making sure that God's servants are being sealed and, and protected first. All right, don't you love that? Now, from first to last, as we saw in Zechariah 1.10, these are the ones whom the Lord has sent to walk to and fro throughout the earth. And here now in Zechariah 6.7, as these, these spirits are going out to and fro throughout the earth, the affairs of the nations are under God's direction, not man's. And it is this certainty that makes prophecy possible, Baldwin has said. It's this certainty that makes prophecy possible because God is in control and God is at work and God has seen all that's happening from beginning to end, you see. We have a reliable word. We have a reliable God who's in control of all that's happening. And you might look at your situation. You might look at life and go, man, things just seem like they're spinning out of control. Man, it looks like the enemies are rising up. The wickedness is ruling and reigning. Lord, what is happening? And, and many in Zechariah's day <clears throat> may have been thinking the same thing. God, what's happened here? We thought we were your people, your nation. We come back to Jerusalem now and things are just in ruins. Like, Lord, are you there? And so these visions are meant to share with God's people that he is at work. He is on the move. And not only the Lord, but his ministering spirits are being sent out. That's why Zechariah says over and over again, it's the Lord of hosts. It's the Lord of angel armies. He's got countless emissaries at his disposal that are carrying out God's will and work. Now, as we talk about the judgment of God here in this last vision, we can get ourselves a little bit worked up, perhaps, at times and wonder, man, judgment of God. I don't like talking about judgment of God because how am I going to make it? How am I going to stand before God? I mean, I'm like, I'm just a wreck I'm a man, I'm guilty. How am I going to stand against God's judgment? You ever feel like that sometimes? Don't raise your hand. We don't want to embarrass you or anything like that. But I'm sure a lot of us can feel at times like, oh man, I I don't know how I'm going to make out here with this. Well, there's good news for you. Because though the judgment is coming for those who reject Jesus, Jesus came to receive the judgment of God for you there on the cross. So that we would not have to Stand up against the judgment of God. Our sin, it put us in a place of deserving the wrath of God. No doubt about that. But Jesus went to the cross to pay the price for your sin. To take the penalty of your sin, which was death. He took that there on the cross for you. He allowed God's judgment to be poured out on him. On him. That's why he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because it was the first time that he experienced separation from God as God's judgment was being poured out on him for our sin. Jesus did that for us. And you can be cleansed and forgiven of your sin now because Jesus came and he's taken that from you. And that can happen by just simply putting your trust in Jesus. Not not trusting in your works, in yourself, in your goodness, in your righteousness. Understand that that leaves us guilty before God. But putting our trust in what Jesus did for us and saying, Jesus, I'm holding on to you. I'm putting on Jesus Christ now that I can be cleansed and seen as righteous now before God. Because God doesn't look at you and your sin. If you're in Christ, he sees Christ's righteousness in and on you. And this is all a free gift of God. It's one of grace, guys, which means you've done nothing to deserve this or earn it. Nobody's excluded from receiving it. Nobody's too far gone because it's all by God's grace. None of us can deserve that or earn it. And by receiving this gift of God in Christ Jesus, we can stand, as I said, as righteous before God. Aren't you glad for that? So that when we read in the Bible about the judgment of God, and it's there lots to see, but when we read about it, we don't have to sit there and go, oh man, (laughs) I don't like this. Skip over, please. Block that out. I don't want to read that. We can look at that and go, thank you, Lord, that you've taken that for me already in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus, that you have made me righteous now. That's what we can do. So when we read about judgment, we don't have to cower in fear. We can rejoice and say, praise Jesus that I am seen as righteous before God by what he's done for me on the cross. It's much what we saw with the vision of Joshua in chapter 3. Joshua, that high priest, 
standing in filthy clothes. He was guilty. But the Lord came, removed those garments, and clothed them in rich robes. We've been given now in Christ a new robe. We are a new creation in him. That when God sees us now, the, 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 the old record of sin is wiped clean. The slate is, is erased. That we can stand now pure white as snow before God. Man, I pray that that just fills your heart with joy and gladness. And, and, and just allows you to serve him all the more and say, God, I am yours because of that incredible gift you've given me, Lord. There's nothing better than just living for you and serving you, God. That's what we have in him. Now listen, speaking of Joshua there, he comes in the picture again as we move along. So that's the eighth vision wrapped up. The visions of the Lord now that Zechariah received, all eight of them, we're finished them. All right? So I hope that you've been encouraged as you go through it. It's just a reminder for Zechariah and those in his day that God's at work. Don't give up. Don't worry. Don't fret at the things that you see around you. Because God is moving in the realm that you don't always see, right? And he's doing that in our lives today, too. So now we look at Joshua. Look at verse 9. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Receive the gift from the captives from Heldai, Tobiah, and Jediah. And yes, that's exactly how you pronounce those. Who have come from Babylon. I have no idea if I'm pronouncing them right, actually. But I go the same day and enter the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. Take the silver and gold. Make an elaborate crown. And set it on the head of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Now, exiles were continuing to return from Babylon. Remember, as I said, at that, there was three different groups that returned from Babylon at different times, all right, over a period of years. That first group that returned from Babylon to Jerusalem was just a small group, about just under 50,000 uh, Jews. Small group, right? People were getting comfortable there in Babylon they were beginning to, again, just get involved in, in commercialism and business. And they were just getting settled and comfortable. They should never have been at home in Babylon. But many of them stayed and it took them a while to kind of root that out of them and return back. So this first group is small. But we see, you know, these people that are continuing to come back now. And here's three more um, exiled Israelites that are returning from Babylon. And they're named here. Heldai, Tobiah, and Jediah. Now, interestingly, J. Vernon McGee points out the name Heldai means robust, Tobiah means God's goodness, and Jediah means God knows. Linking these names together indicates that God knows that through his goodness, he intends to put his king upon the throne, and he will do it in a robust and powerful manner. So we'll cover that more in a second here. But this is this word now. Oftentimes, after a vision, the Lord came with a certain word to Zechariah. Again, a word of encouragement, a word of what God was intending to do. But they come here bringing gifts, it tells us. Gifts of silver and gold, which Zechariah was to use to make, it says, an elaborate crown for Joshua, the high priest. This is not, you know, the typical turban that the high priest wore. They typically wore a headpiece, a turban. But this was speaking of a royal crown, a, a kingly crown that was to be put on Joshua, which makes this very interesting because the high priest was never to take the role of king. Just like a king was never to fulfill the role of a high priest. The civil responsibilities and religious responsibilities were to be kept very separate in Israel. Now at this time, Zerubbabel was the man that was to be the civil leader. He was the guy kind of fulfilling that role. They didn't have a king at this time, all right? But Zerubbabel was kind of the civil leader, but it's not him that has his crown placed on him. It's Joshua. It's a very unusual thing to see happen. No priest was to serve as king. Or king as priest. We have an incident in the Bible where a king tried to take on the responsibility of a priest. It's found in 2 Chronicles chapter 26, verse 16 to 21. And we read there the account of King Uzziah. Remember King Uzziah? He comes into the temple and he desires to burn incense upon the altar of incense. He's a king. It's not his place to do that. He shouldn't have even been in there. And so we see that, that the, the priest at the time is Zariah along with 80 other priests, opposed King Uzziah. And King Uzziah was just adamant. He's like, what are you doing? I'm the king. You guys can't stand in my way. And he was adamant. He became furious about this. He wanted to enter in and do something that he was not entitled to do. Remember what happened? The Lord struck him with leprosy. Right there on the fort, leprosy begins to break out. And the priests are looking at this going, dude, you are in trouble now. You should have listened to us, right? And they throw him out of the temple. 
And he had leprosy until the day he died. He had to live in a house of isolation because he rose up with pride, with this arrogance, and he wanted to take on a role that he was not supposed to do. They were to remain separate. Always that separation of religious and civil leadership in Israel. So why is Joshua now, who is the high priest at the time, why is he crowned with a royal crown? What about Zerubbabel? Wasn't he the civil leader? Yes, but this act of crowning Joshua was to make a prophetic statement. It had a much greater significance than just seeing Joshua with a crown on his head. It was to point to and reveal that one was coming on the scene who would be both a priest and a king. And we see that man introduced in this next verse. Look at verse 12. Then speak to him, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch. From his place he shall branch out, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Yes, he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule on his throne. So he shall be a priest on his throne. And the council of peace shall be between them both. Now this is speaking of none other than who? Jesus Christ, right? He is the branch. This name was introduced to us in Zechariah uh, chapter 3, verse 8. In the second part of that verse, it said, For behold, I'm bringing forth my servant, the branch. And it's an important messianic title, signifying that the Lord would come from the stock of David. Because David's dynasty had appeared to be over, right? There was no longer anybody from David's family that was ruling on the throne. Even though there were numerous prophecies saying that it would continue on forever that David would never cease to have an heir on the throne and so many are thinking what is happening here we've seen the word go forth that that the throne will will be one forever and yet it seems like this dynasty is over but this is where Jesus comes in the picture because he would be the branch that would shoot up from this seemingly dead stump of Jesse Isaiah 11 verse 1 says there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. He is the one that fulfills the promise to David, and that there will be always an heir on David's throne. His throne will be established forever. That's why we see the genealogies of Jesus there in in Matthew and in in Luke, and it's all pointing back through David. 1 Chronicles 17, 11 and 12, And it shall be when your days are fulfilled, when you must go to be with your fathers, that I will set up your seed after you, who will be of your sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build me a house, and I will establish his throne forever. He shall build me a house. And so, again, pointing ultimately ahead to Jesus. And so it tells us here in Zechariah that from his place he shall branch out. In verse 12, from his place he shall branch out. It speaks of this life now that's going to come from where it seemed impossible. It seemed like like David's family had just basically stopped as that ruling power. Dead. But from his place he shall branch out. Jesus will come and bring life out of that which seemed as though there was no life. It'd be like walking out in the desert. You know, when we did our recent trip to, to Vizcaino in Mexico, uh, man, driving through the desert, you just get into some, some places that are just completely dry and just nothing but cactus. It'd be like driving through the desert with there being no signs of life and also just coming up to some, you know, orange grove tree, you know, orange tree grove and just seeing all these fruitful oranges there and just going, how did this happen? How does this grow out here in the desert, you know? And this is the, the idea here that Jesus is coming up from this place here, which seems impossible to do so. And Jesus said in John 15, 5, I'm the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. So from him comes life, and as we are connected to Jesus, who is the branch, as we are connected to him, it's there that we can also become fruitful and have life. Now, interestingly, these words in verse 12, behold the man, those words used to introduce this branch, it's the same thing that Pilate said of Jesus, wasn't it? When he introduced Jesus to the crowds there in Jerusalem after he was beaten, and Pilate said, Eche homo, behold the man. But here in Zechariah's account, it's not the beaten, humiliated Jesus that we are beholding. It's the conquering and victorious Jesus that we are to behold. He is the branch, the one that brings life, who is going to establish the temple of God ultimately. Notice, 
as it says there, he shall build the temple of the Lord, he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule on his throne there in verse 12. He shall build the temple of the Lord. It's not speaking of the temple in Zechariah's day. Zechariah was the one that was going to do that. I think it was in Zechariah 2 that the Lord says, or in Zechariah 4, that the Lord says, Zerubbabel, you're going to do this work. You're going to accomplish it. By your hands, the temple will be rebuilt. So it's not this temple in Zechariah's day that we're speaking of here. This is speaking of the millennial temple. When Jesus returns as the triumphant king indeed and establishes his reign and rule in his kingdom. And his kingdom is going to have a temple. It's going to have a place where we're going to be able to come and, and just see the glory of God and worship the Lord. Now, this is kind of interesting because the Jews sit without a temple today, right? They believe from this passage that their Messiah will come and lead them in the rebuilding of their temple. They look at a passage like that and go, that's it. This is speaking of our Messiah, and our Messiah is going to be the one that's going to rebuild our temple. When you ask them today, and I've been in Israel, you know, a few times, and you can talk to, to Jewish people today and say, what is it that you're looking for in your Messiah? How will you identify who your Messiah is? If he's just a, a man like Moses or something, how will you know it's him? And their answer is, he will lead us in the rebuilding of our temple. That's how they're going to be able to identify their Messiah. There's a small problem with that, though, because in Daniel's 70-week vision, Daniel 9, the last week there reveals that there is coming a prince of the people who's going to establish a covenant, a, a peace treaty, I believe, speaking of the Antichrist. And it's the Antichrist that's going to come on the scene, I believe, that's going to bring in this, this peace because you think of how is Israel ever going to build their temple right now. There's so much hostility going on on the Temple Mount right now. There's such tension there. How are they ever going to build their temple? Well, there's going to be a, a political leader that's going to come on the scene, the Antichrist, who is going to bring in this peace treaty that's going to allow, I believe, Israel to rebuild their temple. Because oftentimes I wonder, why is Israel going to follow after the Antichrist? Wouldn't they kind of begin to recognize him and go, this guy, no, I think he's trouble. The Antichrist, though, as much as he is being led to Satan, is going to come with this form of peace and goodwill. And in leading them in the rebuilding of the temple, it's going to cause the Israelites to follow after him as though he is their Messiah. But it tells us in Daniel 9 that halfway through that week, three and a half years into the tribulation, he's going to come in and, and have that abomination of desolation there in the temple. The temple is going to be built. And the Antichrist is going to come in and defile it, which is what's going to show the Israelites that this is not who they thought he was. And Jesus tells us in Matthew 24 that when you see the abomination of desolation, you flee to the mountains. You get out of there. You hightail it out of Jerusalem because that's when the real fury is going to heat up now. That's when you're going to see a real onslaught against God's people. So, that's the situation that's at work. Let's end that rabbit trail, but let's continue on here in Zechariah 6. Jesus, though, is coming to establish true peace, all right? Antichrist isn't going to bring it. It's going to come in Jesus. And notice how in verse 13, he said, he shall sit and rule on his throne, so he shall be a priest on his throne. He's going to bring peace by being the perfect king priest, of which Joshua, in this chapter, is prophetically symbolizing. It's interesting that the, the three offices there prophet, priest, and king, Jesus, has fulfilled all of them. He came as a prophet at his first coming as he expounded on the heart of God and the truths of God. As he shared who God was prophesying here. He was a prophet. And he came the second time as that priest. All right? To, to, sorry, he, he fulfilled that role of priest as he ascended to heaven. That's what I'm trying to say. Getting mixed up here. He ascended to heaven after... He rose again and ascended to heaven and he's fulfilling the office of priest right now. Look at what, what Hebrews 8 verse 1 and 2 says. Now this is the main point of the things we're saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not met. Hebrews tells us that he ever lives to make intercession for us. He is enacting that role of priest right now for us, going to God on our behalf. And at his second coming, he's going to come as that conquering king where he's going to establish 
his kingdom, his rule, and his reign, and it's going to be one of peace. So he came the first time as a prophet. He is fulfilling that role of priest right now in heaven, interceding for us, and he's going to come again as king. It says, the council of peace shall be between them both. So as Joshua is picturing that, that role of priest and king now as he's being crowned and it's pointing to Jesus, it says here in verse 13 that the council of peace shall be between them both. In the kingdom, there will be perfect peace and justice because all civil and religious authority will be harmonized in one person, in Messiah, Jesus Christ, the king and priest. That's who Jesus is going to be for us and who he is indeed for us today. So verse 14. Now the elaborate crown shall be for a memorial in the temple of the Lord for Helam, Tobiah, Jediah, and Hen, the son of Zephaniah. Even those from afar off shall come and build the temple of the Lord. Then you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you, and this shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. So again, this crown was not not for Joshua specifically. It was to be a memorial. It was to be a reminder to them that a perfect priest and king would indeed be coming. They were looking ahead to the one that would fulfill that, Jesus Christ. And earlier in verse 10, we saw Josiah was named as the son of Zephaniah. Now a man named Hen is seen as the son. So what gives? Why this change of names there? Hen, interestingly, means gracious. Perhaps it's a play on words here saying that this is the blessing that Israel would receive in Jesus by God's gracious work. It would simply be by the gracious hand of God that all these things would come to be. And we know that's the case for us, isn't it? It's all by God's grace that we sit here, that we worship the Lord, that we have life in him. It's all by God's grace, isn't it? So Zechariah is showing that people from afar now are, are going to come and be participating in the building of the temple of the Lord. It's going to be a work that Jews and Gentiles will take part in. It's what God has been doing for the last 2,000 years, isn't it? He is fitting us all together as one in him to be a holy temple for the Lord. It tells us in Ephesians 2, 19 to 22. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. There was such tension at the, at the beginning of the church between Jews and Gentiles. There was still this, this identity crisis, but God was bringing people from afar all together as one, fitting us together as a holy temple of the Lord, you see. And that's what he's doing today in the church. But he is coming again where he will establish his literal physical temple. And it'll be a case where people from all around, Jews and Gentiles, encompassing all the parts of the earth, will come together and have a part in. And that last line now, it's meant to give us great hope. It's meant to give those in Zechariah's day great hope. Notice what it says there. This shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. All these things that we've been talking about, it's going to happen, he's saying. If you diligently obey the voice of the Lord here. It's meant to give them great hope. Because as, as were all the visions that we looked at, and, and this last account of this coming king priest, these were meant to encourage the workers to just continue on, to keep serving the Lord. Don't give up because the Lord is with them and has greater things in store for them. So be obedient. Keep serving. Keep being used to the Lord. It's the charge for us today as well, isn't it? Don't give up, guys. Don't feel like it's too hard. It's too great. The, the cost is too great. Don't give up. Keep on serving the Lord. Keep focused on him and know and trust that he is at work and he's accomplishing things even though we may not see it with our natural eyes. Keep walking by faith, not by sight because God is at work and he will bring all these things to pass as we keep serving him obediently and walking with him. The idea is that in order to participate in the blessings of those distant days, the community must continue to be obedient. You know, the Lord desires to bless, doesn't he? And the blessing flows from serving him faithfully. May we do that. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, God, 
as we look through this word here, Lord, the way that you just use your word to speak to us. God, this is a word that was given to Zechariah in his day, and yet we see, Lord, how it just weaves its way through all of history and into a future day as well. A future day that we have as well to look forward to, just as Zechariah did and the people in his day. Lord, we look forward to your soon and coming return. I believe it's, it's, it, you're coming soon. So God, may we be ready. Lord, may we not look at the things going on in our world and be discouraged. May we not look at the things going on, the, the chaos and the difficulty and lose hope. Lord, may we look to you and know that, God, you're on the move and none of these things are happening apart from you allowing them to happen. You're accomplishing your will and seeing your work go forth. And we take comfort in that. God, we know that you're going to bring all these things to pass. And all we need to do is just keep our eyes on you. Keep trusting and be faithful and just be serving you, Lord. God, may you keep our eyes on you May we be those that are just serving you, focused on you, hearing from you daily, Lord. And just again, like you said to Zechariah, being filled with your spirit, Lord. This isn't about might or power, but it's by your spirit, Lord, that all these things come to be. So use us, God. May we be faithful to serve and be obedient and see just your blessing unfold. And so we ask these things on your name, Jesus. Amen.